examples that I would like to roll with tonight. One is, um, please feel free to interrupt at any time. Uh, I'll be pausing here and there just and asking for some reactions and for some of your own experiences. We said in the description that we wanted this to be hopefully a bit of a discussion, not just me talking at you. Um, so uh, I think you probably all see my screen. They are coming for us, it happens, um, and it's something that I've lived with a few times. I'll start by saying, I'm not a PowerPoint guy. I don't like the PowerPoint so much, but um, I, I felt like I should make something that we could at least have as a representation, something to stare at while we're thinking about things. And it's a good place just to drop in quotations and stuff like that. So uh, I apologize to um, Edward Tufty for my PowerPoint slides, but that's just kind of the way it goes sometimes. Um, so yeah. This is all about when your best intentions uh, go awry and um, you end up in a place where a redesign or your effort to change, positively change the user experience of the product that you work on lands really badly with at least some of the people that you've done this design for. And it's a, uh, I, I don't know how many of you have experienced this. Um, I'll, I think we'll hear that as time goes on. Um, but it certainly happened to me a fair bit, and it's something that uh, I continue to sort of think about a lot uh, in my daily work. So, so this is about redesigns. It's about getting a backlash from a, a user base. So this is people typically that are sort of already there, already using the product. Uh, and yes, I'd like to hear anybody else's feedback. So they're coming for us. They're coming for us with pitchforks and torches and tweets and all kinds of stuff, but it's nothing new. Um, you know, I went fishing around for some articles. I remember back when Facebook was taking off and uh, all the new social networks were coming on board. And every time they would do a redesign, there would be news articles about it because everybody was so mad. And so uh, they, you know, the rage just flew uh, and, you know, Facebook came first. Twitter came along and actually gave people a platform to complain about Facebook, I guess, and, and among other things. But um, I just grabbed a couple of screen caps from different sort of years. So we go back to 2009, where CNET was discussing at length the, the hate, uh, as was um, TechCrunch talking about Pinterest and their redesign. And you'll notice this recurring that the word hate flies around a lot. And, you know, when I was raising my kids, we tried to really avoid them ever expressing hate for anything. We could say you dislike something, but hating something, particularly a software redesign seems a little extreme. But as we'll see, that's, you know, that's a visceral reaction to something that, that uh, people are really unhappy about. Uh, this last one, um, UX psychology, I thought was a sort of an interesting one, just because um, it's a fairly new blog. And it's, this is a PhD in psychology who's starting to write some interesting articles this is on Substack. Um, and I will share out uh, sort of a list of some of the websites and resources that I reference here. Um, and, uh, you know, she goes into a little bit of depth and actually references some research material, which I'll try and kind of pull in. I will say this is not going to be a scientific talk in any way, shape or form. It, as we said, it's mostly anecdotes, some of my personal experience and some of the efforts that uh, I and my, the teams that I've worked with have made to kind of work through some of this that we all know happens. So pretty typical piece of feedback. Now I've been fortunate uh, to have kept some verbatims from some projects that I've done in the past. And uh, so this is one, and I think it kind of lands pretty squarely in the normal sort of thing that you hear when Either you make a change, uh, whether it's a wholesale change or a small change, or whether it's um, it's somebody moving from one platform to another. And, and a detail here that just might paint a little color to it is that um, uh, a lot of my references are from a, a, a position I held for five-ish years with a company called Biblio Commons here in Toronto. Biblio Commons is a, software as a service public library catalog um, company. And they basically what they create is a, is a kind of overlay layer, uh, a white labeled layer on top of the, the library's 
public catalog software. And so what often happens is the, uh, the library will engage Biblio Commons. Uh, they'll you know, do a big project to replace their old catalog. They'll launch Biblio Commons, and then there'll be just flood of reaction. And it's because those end users don't see this as a new product. They don't see it as anything that's, uh, that's been introduced that's new. They see as their library has introduced a change to their web experience, um, and they just want it fixed. So uh, you'll see these things over and over again. And uh, the why fix something that wasn't broken is probably the most common one around. And in those screenshots that I had up there earlier, same sentiment. There's this notion of, I like it the way it is. So, and I don't see a need for it to change. So why did you change it on me? Um, and I kind of think of this as being like users have been exercising radical candor with the uh, with the people that make the software for them over those years. And, and all that feedback was kind of pre Kim Scott, but um, they weren't afraid to tell us what they thought. And I'll say that most of the work that I've done in this, uh, in regard to this kind of stuff is not, it's not the kind of stuff that people tweet about. So a lot of the, the kind of the displeasure that's expressed by users of different software, tends to come through the social networks now. And Twitter is of course an obvious one that, that uh, is really excellent for um, complaining about things and sort of highlighting uh, um, group displeasure. Um, <clears throat> most of the stuff that uh, I had, which left me feeling this way, actually was not unsolicited, right? Like this, this mainly came through feedback mechanisms that were built into the web experience. And so I'm not quite sure what we were expecting when we put these things into our software, but uh, I, well, I think we were expecting, you know, nice things to be said to us, hopefully. This top one here is actually the, the feedback box from, oops, Biblio Commons. And this category selector, if I could get things to hold still, is uh, it had a whole list of different things. This was compliments, complaints. Uh, for a long time, it didn't even have compliments. It was like, you could complain, you could tell us about a bug uh, or make a suggestion, but we didn't explicitly have a complaints sort of facet there. Uh, it took me a while to convince our, uh, our founder and CEO that that might be an appropriate way to kind of at least accept that some people wouldn't be so happy. So, it was a range of options. Uh, you can see the one on the right here is, this is the, the RC, uh, the Royal Bank of Canada's online feedback form. This is on every one of the pages that you see, uh, both signed in and not signed in. Um, so these are just examples of, you know, we're asking for it. So when we get it, we shouldn't be too surprised. Um, oh, this is great, I love it. Pleasantly surprised, great sight, woohoo, yay. I'm all, all ears when I get that stuff. But then, then they come back and they, they come with their torches and their pick for, pitchforks and their clubs. And, uh, and then they get nasty. So, you know, the word sucks comes up a lot. Um, and this one is interesting, and I don't really have a visual for it, but I want you to picture in your mind that this is a person who was used to a website that kind of carried along with it paradigms from probably like the early 2000s. So most sites at the time had a very clear login button at the top, usually in the top right. You were able to um, uh, access sort of key elements from a global navigation in the top right. So you had your login, probably an account link, all those sorts of things. Um, and this piece of feedback came uh, right after Biblio Commons moved from that paradigm, which it had had for a very long time, to what we, you know, I guess we'd think of as a, a normalized or modern uh, menu that rolled uh, account uh, functions and, and um, links under a single drop-down menu. And of course, 
when you design that, you're looking around at all the properties on the web that other people are looking at. We were asked very often by uh, our management to consider what the average user's web experience is. And, uh, and when you do that, you're, you know, we all look for best practices. We look for patterns and trends. Um, and you, you see that and, and there's a, a new way of doing uh, a header and that header includes an icon that represents a user account. You pull down the icon. If you're not already logged in, it has a login button. If you are logged in, it has access to account links and stuff like that. So this was a, a change that we made. And um, the, it, this was often the result. Uh, and that result would either come when people who were on an older library system got Biblio Commons. And so suddenly all of the things that they understood, their entire world had changed. Uh, or when we actually launched the, the change to users who were used to the existing Biblio Commons, they uh, were equally flummoxed by this. Um, and uh, they uh, showed their displeasure in this way. So uh, I didn't get fired for this. Um, I was a little insulted because they called me an IT person and I've never really thought of myself as an IT person, but um, that was okay. Um, but every one of these little slings and arrows really led me to think about just some of the principles that we took into the design process and how we could try and minimize this impact on people. Um, and I, I, I don't think uh, Bridget had said this at the time. So some of this is going back to you know, 2014, 2015, 16, um, and a little bit earlier. I started at Biblio Commons in 2012. So, uh, but this, when I first saw it really, really nailed some things for me because this is what we had been trying to do. We had been looking at the world around us and saying, <clears throat> you know, people who are using our software, which hasn't been updated for six, seven years, uh, they're experiencing all this other great software, these experiences that they look modern, they, the interaction design is much cleaner, uh, they're easier to read, there's less clutter, the, they, and most of all at the time, they were responsive, which meant that they worked on all of these different device types. So this drove a lot of our thinking. We, we thought about that, that sort of last best experience being outside of our product. And then they come into our product and they're very disappointed with what they see. Um, and so our whole sort of raison d'etre for a long time was to move our product uh, sort of forward in the way that people um, uh, sort of would have an expectation of. And, and we thought that, that was a, a good strategy and, and most times it is. Um, and so uh, that's kind of the driving force. I want you to keep that in mind as I sort of bring up some more examples and we think about um, uh, what impact that might have on end users. So the next little bit, uh, I'm gonna talk about a few sort of specific cases that I've encountered more recently. Um, and then I'm going to come back to the uh, the Biblio Commons and go into a little bit deeper dive. But I'm going to stop here for a second. I just want to take a pulse. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to stop sharing for a second because I just want to see um, and maybe ask, has anybody else worked on a product where they got this kind of feedback? And you know, how did it make you feel? Anyone? You've been that lucky? Yeah. Well, I guess I, I've certainly worked on products that probably got that kind of feedback, but I, I didn't get it. Sort of you never hear it. But uh, yeah, and I have some, some insights into, you know, what, what I did hear sort of, in, you know, in terms of the aggregated feedback, I see what, why people might feel the way they did. So I think right. did. Anyone else get really kicked in the butt by an end user? Oh, you're so lucky. So I'm just sharing my pain with all of you and, and you're gonna vicariously- uh, um, oh, I think we, we oh, got wait. a comment. I got a, a chat comment. All right, hold on. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> okay, the product, okay. So you're maybe, Steven's maybe like really worried that this is gonna happen to him and maybe we need some <laughs> mitigation. Okay, so 
good. I, I have I have a, a few tips for you a bit later. So let's let's get back into it. And um, I'm going to reshare just just because I know you all love my PowerPoint slides. And let's just uh, all right. So experts, this is um, and I'll, I'll I'll make a little aside right now. So when Paul and I were first discussing what I might talk about, because he was kind enough to approach me and ask if I wanted to talk to the group. Um, you know, I, I threw around a couple of ideas. And one of those ideas was my grumpy old man idea, which is like, there are a lot of really great books about design. And um, uh, I feel like not enough people have read some of the classics of, of uh, design literature. And, and I thought about doing a bit of a talk just about those books and the influence that they've had on my career. Um, and I decided that that would be a little too dry. And Paul had already done a blog post on on some of the great UX books. So that uh, we nixed that and went with this one, but you're gonna hear some of my book bias through uh, some of this presentation. So um, so this is about experts. And um, <clears throat> a lot of my thinking around uh, user expertise comes from uh, Alan Cooper's About Face, uh, a fantastic book. If you, if you don't have it on your desk ready, uh, at any opportunity, I, I feel very sorry for you. Um, but he talks a lot about expertise and what that means for end users of your software, uh, has a lot of great design principles around expertise. Um, and uh, the thing that the book says primarily is that nobody wants to be a beginner, right? Like we all, we want to, uh, we don't necessarily wanna be an expert in the tools that we use, the software that we use, but we don't want to stay a beginner either. We, we need to optimize our designs for intermediate use. And intermediate users, you know, they're competent with the software and they're able to kind of handle most regular tasks. It's only when, you know, they encounter something that's infrequent or uh, that's not part of their kind of core tasks um, that they, they sort of lose that sort of intermediary skill set and they go back to kind of being a beginner in that end. But there are very few people that are like full on experts in their software. But when you do have them, when you have specialized software that's that's been uh, designed especially for them to complete specific tasks, uh, or maybe it hasn't been designed specifically for them to complete those tasks, but they're, they, they've figured it out. They've done the training. They've used the software for years. They've created their own pathways through the software. And you've all, I'm sure, seen those design versus user experience memes with the, you know, the paved pathway and then the worn pathway across the park. Um, you know, a lot of these kinds of users have, they've worn their paths and they've, they've like created these very clear uh, uh, methods for moving around inside the software. So uh, even when you do something like a visual redesign, and this is something that the team I work with now has encountered a few times. Imagine this, you, you, you know, you have a team you have a design system that you've been building. Uh, you have heard from your sales organization that people buy with their eyes, they, that people, that new customers really value design. And, and we know the product that we have now doesn't look very good when we show it to these new customers. So our mandate is to update the design. We, we apply all of the principles that we can without actually changing the functionality because that would be a bigger job and it's a negotiation with our engineering partners and all that kind of stuff. So, so what we really do is we, we sort of do a reskin, uh, tries to bring about visual consistency, uh, add readability, uh, include accessibility where possible, uh, redo navigation, all the things that you do when you, when you consider uh, how, how you're gonna uh, redesign something. And then you get this slack after you've lost, uh, after you've launched the product and you kind of feel like, what was the point of that? Because what, what you've done is that you've uh, gotten in the way of somebody getting their work done. And even though your changes weren't fundamentally messing with the interaction or the workflow, just the very fact that it changed caught somebody at the wrong time. So, and this is sort of a, this is a true story. We uh, have released some software um, and had, thank God for the notion of um, feature flags in software deployment now. 
because we were able to take a customer who was unhappy with what he perceived as uh, forced change, and he asked us to turn it off, and we did. So our, you know, our customer success team has done this, but what it does for us as designers is that it kind of undermines our value because, uh, you know, other people in the organization look at that and they say, like, well, what, you know, what's the point of that? Why did you put all that work in if nobody likes it? Now, I know I've, there are researchers on the call and you're all kind of like, didn't you do any research first? And uh, I would never say that we didn't do any research about this. But again, this when you approach sort of a reskin or a, a visual overhaul, rarely do you sort of test that out beyond kind of people say it looks nice or it doesn't. So it's a, a bit of an outlier. I think that if we were trying to change something that was uh impactful in terms of the actual user experience we would never have released it without uh the, the kind of rigor that you would normally like to have in there but uh the the point here really is that we we didn't change the experience other than uh, a few of the key things that we think of as being visual design uh, principles uh and they just didn't land well um so that's that's case one uh, and it's a, a newer and uh, it's sort of thorn in my side at the moment. This is a little bit older one, and this is going to be a little bit funny, I hope, think maybe. Uh, so I did a stint with a big Canadian bank, um, one of the blue ones. Uh, I'm not going to show any IP from that bank, but I'm sensitive to them yelling at me uh, after the fact. But um, <clears throat> Canadians have a really interesting relationship with banks, as you know, and uh, we struggle a, a fair bit um, with the notion that banks are not really spending a lot of time and their money uh, on the experience that we have with them. And uh, I think that came through loud and clear a few years ago with uh, the big blue bank, RBC, um, doing a, a design relaunch. And where this gets kind of funny is, so on the left, you can see a screenshot of a, uh, this is a LinkedIn post, which I'm gonna show you in a second. On the right is a screenshot from that LinkedIn post, which is highlighting um, tweets about this redesign. So RBC, I, I didn't work for them at the time. I was still at Biblio Commons. RBC uh, uh, redesigned their um, retail banking experience. They launched it with very little in the way of warning. And the uh, uh, the Twitter sphere went crazy. And let's take a look at some of the, I don't know if you can see this really clearly, but we're back to our um, don't fix what ain't broken. Um, people uh, complain about intuitive. It's not intuitive at all. Please revert back. I don't think RBC had that much in the way of feature flags at the time. Whoops. So they couldn't revert back. Um, you know, you're an old man inside when you call RBC to complain about their online banking layout. So there were, again, a very visceral response to this uh, by all of these, these customers. And so the person that wrote this post, now I have to do a quick stop share, start share, but I think you'll, I think it's worth it. Hang in there. Um, and get the right thing. Yes, this one. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to the actual page. So this is the page. You may recognize the person who wrote the post as somebody who has presented to Torkai in the past. She's the founder and CEO of Click Insight. Uh, I was looking at the old videos and I saw that she had presented to you. But the, so this is the weird small, uh, small world thing is that um, she, she wrote this post right after it happened and she was very clear like she iterated the problems that she saw with it that there was a summary at the top that she found was not use, useful at all to her there was too much scrolling and those of us who have been designing for the web for a long time i think get a little tired of the scrolling kind of argument when you certainly when you watch people on their phones and their thumb is just non-stop because everything scrolls forever on your phone uh aza raskin is always you know, taking credit for having invented infinite scroll. And I think, you know, 
good on him. Maybe he seems to think it's one of the worst things he's ever done, but uh, certainly scrolling is real, right? But to many users, scrolling is a pain. So uh, she's expressed that really well. Uh, and uh, of course, she's expressed that uh, the upsell in marketing took precedence over her task completion. So the bank has actually interrupted her flow in order to provide things that are important to them. They're going to sell to them. And, uh, uh, you know, customers don't like that so much. So she asked whether she could change back to the old thing. Uh, she liked the RBC Android app more. So she was going to use that instead. Uh, and at the time, RBC hadn't updated its commercial banking, so she was hoping they wouldn't do that either. And this is the screenshot I showed you earlier. So where this gets funny is that uh, I actually replied to the post a long, long time ago. And I have to just, you know, we all love LinkedIn, but um, when it sorts by relevance, it's hard to find the thing yet. There we go. So at the time, I was going through my own pain. And so I thought I would stick up for RBC a little bit and talked about a lot of these things, right? That any public launch was going to get uh, some negative responses. I could, as a designer, I could infer from what I saw because I was an RBC customer, I could in infer that they had reasons for making some of those choices. Um, you know, and maybe they didn't have full control over all those decisions. You know, we as designers are only one, one part of a machine that actually creates a product and gets it out to market. But I, I think that that, um, you know, that experience of trying to design the right thing is something that we share. Um, and, uh, you know, I just made some observations and there were some, she, you know, she replied back um, again, she, Steve Krug. So she, she quoted Steve Krug to me, which, you know, I think was important um, because we all admire how, how he popularized user experience. Uh, I don't think a lot of people kind of understood what we did. And then he wrote his book that was very accessible. Lots of people read it or at least know about it. And it has a really great title, Don't Make Me Think. So uh, I get, that's fine. That's, I got that. Um, got a comparative, you know, maybe, maybe RBC should have done a uh, um, competitive study or something with CIBC. So that was cool. And then she provided a uh, sort of a follow-up reply screenshot um, that showed those two side by side. So that was good. And then uh, June uh, wrote a follow-up a few days later. Maybe this is not going to go the right place. Um, I think it's in the related. Uh, I'll just talk about it. About mm, week, two weeks later, RBC made some changes. It, obviously, they felt the burn and they were unhappy about the, the PR problem. And so they shif shifted some things around and, and uh, uh, June kindly wrote a follow-up saying, you know, they've listened, uh, RBC has responded. Uh, and so the consumers, the consumers win. And I think that that's a great example of something. Here's another book plug. Uh, here, uh, that our good friend Victor Papanek wrote back. Uh, I'm not sure when he wrote the Manifesto of Consumer Rights. I have a copy of Papanek's book, uh, Designed for the Real World, that is uh, strangely devoid of an updated copyright date. Um, the weird part is that the copyright in the book is like 70s, but there are references up to 1985 in the text. So there's something missing. Anyway, the point of this is that uh, Victor was very clear uh, that consumers had rights. And a, a couple of these are kind of interesting for us as designers to think about when we, when we put things out into the world, when we, when we you know, give birth to the products that we've designed in tandem with our product partners and all the other people that we work with. Um, and the... Uh, the big one is is um, the number six kind of is is sort of related, but um, the the notion that they can be the right to represent it, representation is the to be consulted and to participate in the decisions affecting consumers, and this is something that I think certainly um, you know 
seems like a good idea. It's it's one of those things that uh, I don't think the digital world does in any way, shape, or form. We we think about the tests that we conduct on people without their knowing. We think about um, you know I think we mentioned in the early conversation A/B testing, uh, all the experiments that we do on people that they have no idea about. Victor would be very unhappy about. But I think in this case, uh, June and the other people who were unhappy um, really were kind of exercising their rights as consumers. And I think she made that clear that that was her focus. So, um, and as designers, I think it's, it's good. It's a good reminder uh, when we get caught up in the machine of creating products and the machinery of the modern web and how products are conceived and how we we find the people that we want to have use them and we, we help to tailor our product to their needs without really their explicit input. Um, you know, it's buried there in the terms of use, but um, uh, this is, it's just a good reminder for all of us. And what all this is really speaking about is that change happens. Um, I took a, a course in Agile methodologies in 2010, and the consultant who was teaching it went around the table and asked us all what we thought change was or change meant. And we were all wrong because he said the answer was change just is. Change is. So I'll take that. Uh, I think it makes sense. Um, but our job as designers is to ease the burden of change. And um, so I think about these comments that have come at us over time uh, and they, they kind of fall into a lot of different classes. The big one is like, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Why are you disrupting my relationship with the software, how I use it? Um, I didn't ask for this. There's a motivation that's not mine. It's not in my interest. Uh, so we heard a lot, you know, in, in certainly the banks, I'm sure hear this a lot. Um, Biblio Commons, we heard this a lot because it was public libraries and most public libraries are funded through tax dollars, not all, but most. Uh, many people saw that as a waste of their money, their money, not, uh, not their, um, their county or city or government, but uh, theirs. Like this was a personal investment. Um, they hadn't solved any of their problems. And in the case of Biblio Commons, some of the trouble that we had was that our mandate, our mission was actually to change people's behavior. Robert Fabricant uh, at a keynote speech in 2009 at the Interaction Conference, um, talk, his talk was called Behavior is Our Medium. And um, a lot of what we had to do as a design and product team at Publio Commons was actually change the behavior enough of patrons to uh, benefit the public library. And, and some of that comes through um, the fact that public libraries, if we discount the notion of ebooks, but even they are kind of, they're, they're a resource scarce um, organization. There aren't enough books for everybody. And so people need to share and sharing is good and it's important, but uh, many uh, public library patrons don't see it that way. And so there's a lot of book hoarding. There's a lot of, like there are antisocial behaviors in the public library world. And our mandate was to try and change some of those through interaction design, through the design process and understand how we could both nudge people into behaviors that were better for the library itself without completely undoing their relationship with the library. Um, now this change aversion thing, this is a really interesting, I found a blog by the uh, Google Ventures folks. They wrote this a long time ago, I think 2012. So around the time I was starting at Biblio Commons. And the, the blog post itself is really interesting because it talks about the, the amount of study and research they give to change. Because Google, of course, was at the forefront of beta testing and, and um, you know, A-B testing and really honing how they designed their products and how those products uh, went out into the market. And so they came up with this matrix that was, uh, first of all, they defined uh, um, change aversion as a temporary state, right? So Google Ventures, the folks that were writing for there, they really felt like it was, for the most part, unless you really screwed up, uh, change aversion was temporary. It came and it went, 
And as long as after a certain time period, the value that you're going to introduce was recognized, then you were okay. So that's kind of good. So we really, the, the top uh, four, I mean, they, they also explored like the attraction um, uh, patterns where like you, you actually are interested in the change that's coming and you either, it fulfills your expectations or it doesn't quite, and then you get that downstream. But the top four are really kind of like the, the typical paths and you really want to be aversion to delight. You know, everybody wants to like introduce their change and know that it was actually the right change and that in the long term it delivered the, the expectations of the users. Um, aversion to neutral is okay. You know, it's, it's a big change. It's about the same. That's fine. At least you haven't made it worse. Nobody wants the partial negative or negative, but sometimes that happens, right? So, um, and a couple of, so back to our books, this is Alan Cooper again, a couple of the design principles that he, you know, asks us to think about when we're in the act of designing is to think about, and he doesn't express it this way, but I think these impact people's reaction to change. So um, if we go back up and think about the, um, you know, aversion to neutral or aversion to delight or any of the other kind of aversion to do's. Like if the rewards justify the change, then uh, people will get over it and they'll they'll get on with it. So, but if they don't, then they won't. Um, and when we introduce these changes, we always, always, always have to think this way about our is that they're intelligent, but they are very busy. And any change we introduce is going to be it's going to impact them in some way, at least initially. Um, so some of the literature that's uh, uh, out there has some suggestions for how to um, uh, how to mitigate the effects. Of change. And I thought I would ask if any of you had some ideas about how to avoid that kind of like rug pulled out from under me. I didn't ask for this. Um, it was fine the way it is. Don't fix what's broken. Does anybody have any ideas about techniques that, that could be used to, uh, to do that? It's not recommended, but you just don't update things. Okay, I think that's right. Why, why isn't it recommended? I'm curious about the answer to that. Because there's all kinds of benefits that come with upgrades like security and other things. But right. some of us don't like to update things, so. That's a, an attempt to experience control over lack of control we get as users. Right. Well, one, one of the members of my team at work uh, is uh, not happy right now because she hates updating her software until she's good and ready for it. And we've had to institute like an auto, like our IT is now like auto updating our software. And um, so the dreaded Figma update is always something that that um, she has to deal with. But I, I I totally hear that. Like some of us will just love it to just stay the same. Um, anybody else got a thought on how you could mitigate some of this stuff? An announcement on the, the website or whatever product, um, just saying, hey, we're going to be updating soon. Here are the changes, here are the benefits. Um, and, you know, maybe a, a rollout, hey, if you'd like to try these changes now, click here and you're switched over to the new UI. Totally good idea. Anybody else? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'll, let me show you the list that I compiled from multiple sources. Again, this is uh, that um, UX psychology blog article pointed me to a bunch of um, uh, uh, academic articles and other things. Uh, the Google Ventures article also had some of these suggestions, but these, this is sort of the aggregate. Uh, so, you know, warn users about the changes. We heard that. That's good. Um, communicate the nature and value of the changes when you're in that warning. Uh, and even as the change is happening, like, why did we do this? And there are a lot of onboarding platforms and, you know, hopscotch tours and all of those kinds of things that where, where you see people trying to do this. Hey, this is new. 
uh, here's why it's new. It's going to be great for you. Don't throw tomatoes at us just yet. Um, allow the opt-in and revert back. Uh, let the users toggle between old and new versions. Um, do more re user research. Just make sure that change is absolutely essential <laughs> and make sure you nail who's getting it. Um, make the changes as small as possible. Increment. Uh, now that one rarely flies with marketing, product marketing, product managers, anybody who wants to deliver a big splash is usually reluctant because the big splash means uh, more uh, press, more interest, et cetera, et cetera. So it's harder to get people to, to do that. Um, and the other one that they recommend is, is don't panic right out of the gate. Wait to see whether that, that graph that we were looking at up here, wait to see whether we get that bounce back that we need. Um, okay, so I am going to move into a little bit more of a deep dive on something we did for Biblio Commons. I'm gonna go pretty quickly because my time is going faster than I thought. So I'll just give you a high level overview Then I'm gonna to switch to a different, a different slide deck, which I will integrate later, Paul, for your distribution, but um, it was just easier for me to kind of gauge whether we do this or not. Uh, so yeah, what happens when you try and modernize? It's not the books that get burned. Uh, so just uh, some context, Biblio Commons, I showed you that feedback form. This is like an annual stat and maybe indicates a little bit how passionate public library patrons are about the online service. So it's a, a pretty big number. Um, now, the context for that is uh, at the time, I think we had about 7 million registered users. So it's scale. This is like a lot of people and they're actively using the software every single day or at least every week. Um, and uh, so not too bad a ratio, actually. 17,000, some compliments, some complaints, you know, suggestions for features and improvements, which were often couched in complaints, but were categorized separately. Uh, I will say about those feedback boxes, just in case anyone's wondering, a lot of people don't know what they're for. So these compliments would be less about the software and more about, I love the library or, you know, whoever was working at the, this branch on Saturday was so helpful. Thank you very much. So if I took out a bunch of those, we'd probably cut 20% of them out. But regardless, this is, this is kind of the, the scale that we're dealing with. And keep in mind that this is the kind of complaint feedback that we would get more often than not. Um, and no explanation, just like, you know, make me feel good about stuff. So I'm going to do one more switcheroo of slide decks here. And I'm going to uh, get this into the right view. PowerPoint has this great um, reading view, so it doesn't have to take over my whole screen and make me feel lost, which often happens. All right, there we go. So what I'm gonna tell you about in rapid fire today is uh, uh, some changes that we made to what was called the borrowing experience at the library. Um, and this will kind of cover off uh, us trying to hit as many of those notes that I showed you earlier in, uh, from a preventative perspective as we could. And I wanna give a little shout out to my friend Lavinia who worked with me on this. It was really, this was almost a one person job, uh, one and a half people because it was only part of my job. Uh, and she carried the lion's share over an eight to 10 month period um, and uh, really amazing work. So we were taking this, this experience, the core experience of the library, which is borrowing, placing reserves or holds on things uh, and managing uh, you know, when things have to come back, all of that stuff. And this is what it kind of looked like pre-2014, uh, pre 2014, 2015. At the top there, you can see that, that top bar that the person was very confused when that went away and that all they saw was a little icon of themselves. Um, so we went through a bunch of uh, different processes around the design itself. And I won't go into that because that's a design process and this is more about mitigating the kind of impact of the design. Uh, so the first thing we did as we were building up the design was we tried to get some 
sense of how people were going to react to it. So we used a tool called Chalkmark. We put in kind of medium fidelity wireframes. We asked uh, through uh, the feedback mechanism that we had on the website whether people would, would be interested in taking part. And so we very quickly built up a panel of people who we could go back to and uh, do more research with because we had so many volunteers. So we ran click tests, gave them some tasks, uh, asked them what they would have to do if they needed to su suspend a hold. If you're not a library user, when you place a hold in a library uh, management system, you can actually pull it out of the hold queue for a while if you, if you can't use the book right away. And then you get to join the line right back where you were, which seems a little unfair, but whatever. Um, so how did, how did people do it? We had like 393 people participate, a bunch of them finished it. So we at least had first validation that this wasn't gonna break their world. And we got some good feedback in with that. Like there were people were too many, there was too much stuff going on. Took them a while to find some of the buttons that we had there. So we went back, we revised again uh, and did some more tests. Uh, and then we took that. And the great part at BiblioCommons, we had a really good engineering team who were actually able to take those designs. They built them in kind of a parallel environment, which meant that we could actually test live code without interrupting anybody else's life uh, and uh, have people follow the tasks against their own book collection. So these weren't prototypes. This was actually using the software with their own accounts, but it was the completely new design on top. So we did that on a live demo server. We asked just to do some contextual inquiry we got lots of feedback. And one of the things here that's important to know is that we had classified our users by kind of their technical capability, the masters, people that were kind of in between, they're savvy, or the people that we, we knew were sort of tentative in their relationship to technology. And then we classified them according to like their library relationship, like the master borrower who just like works every angle at the library to get as many books as they can. Some people that are just like use it all the time and some people that eh, every couple of months to borrow a book. Uh, some people liked it. Some people give us some good advice around being a little too, uh, a little too precise with our, you know, making sure do you really want to cancel this. Um, I should just be able to do it. It's okay. I trust you. And so after a lot of that, like 12 of those full hour processed all that did some more revisions uh we did the other thing which was we released this as a public uh preview so every logged in user got the option to um give it a try when they hit yes i'll preview they had an experience that was the completely the new experience they had an escape hatch so they could go back to their original uh version if, if anything went wrong because it was beta software uh, and uh, also in that preview experience, the, the top bar introduced a feedback box where they could uh, tell us what they thought about that experience. And like I said, scale volume. In one week, we got like this many feedback responses. And this is like open text message feedback from patrons who had experienced the thing. And it ranged to all sorts of things. Lots of people liked it. This last person you can see was not a fan. Uh, they were very, very unhappy, but uh, that was, you know, this was a tremendous amount of feedback and gave us some more confidence in terms of uh, moving forward and fixing some more things. Um, we learned some really interesting things through that process that helped us tweak the design. So we, we learned some stuff about language that people didn't understand. We learned stuff about um, uh, things that we missed in the implementation, um, navigational cues that people weren't finding. So we went back to the drawing board, we designed it again, and we finally did a release and out it went. So the, the thing for that was we learned more about the people and their attitudes towards change than we expected to um, and we saw this middle part was it really it was about habits. And when I did the, the sort of uh, academic reading to support some of this presentation tonight, uh, a lot of the academic uh, articles that people are really about habits. And it's interesting if you go and read any of that information, just the relationship between like uh, the habitual um, 
nature of humans and their reaction to change. Uh, and then also, if you think about the flip side, which is um, how that's currently leveraged in many of our uh, digital platforms and social media where habits actually become addictions. And that's a whole separate topic, but I think it's a really interesting sort of yin and yang in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the way the human psyche and its, uh, its tendency towards uh, habit and um, sort of, I can't pronounce it because I'll flub it, but basically that being an autonomous, autom automaton who um, uh, sort of just goes through the motions and our software is really well designed for that, right? Like all of our software, our wayfinding, all that stuff allows people to create those paths and then when we redesign, we take those away from them and it creates that jarring experience of not understanding why the change needed to happen. Um, okay, so we're getting right close to the end. Um, I wanted to get back to my original, we're almost there. So we launched that and, you know, we didn't please everybody. Can never please ever, anybody. This is a, a, one of the few social media platforms that I actually paid any attention to was a, was a library subreddit. And I thought I would get some expert opinion. And uh, I went back to look at the thread again. And uh, the uh, unfortunately, the original content of the, the thread is gone. But you, the title sort of says it all. This person was not happy. Um, and argued against our notion that it's really just change of version. He decided that we we're just bad designers. And I, that was fair. I actually had a fairly extended uh, interaction with him on Reddit. Um, uh, it, didn't, it didn't result in anything. It was an unresolved conversation. And now, of course, it's gone. But, uh, but we also had this. And I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes. I don't know how long it'll take you to read it. Every time I read this thing, I get a little misty because this is like the, the most perfect outcome for change that I've ever encountered in my career. Um, and this person was very generous in telling us how she felt about it. Um, you know, you saw the effort that we went to to try and mitigate uh, the change. She still didn't like it when it first happened. But what she realized was that the change actually did add value for her. It took a while for her to recognize the value. And what was really important about that is, the, is just how she realized that it, it was somehow simpler, that um, there was an information block that we had labored over for a long, long time that she found solved problems for her. Um, and the most interesting part about this is the last sentence where she kind of wondered whether we'd been upgrading or tweaking it for uh, a long time, and we actually hadn't. It was the exact same version that she saw when we launched it um, because we wanted it to settle for a while. We wanted to follow that advice of allowing something to sit, give people a chance to get used to it and run with it. And that was uh, that was sort of the, the triumph of the day. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. I had a little section at the end that was a bit of a denouement, but I um, my timing's a little off uh because we we didn't start right on seven um but i do want to open the floor to any questions comments thoughts 